is The Chris Abraham Show. Hey there, this is season six, episode three of The Chris Abraham Show. Ah, beautiful fall day, around 50 degrees Fahrenheit and booger to booger to booger to booger to degrees Celsius. A perfectly blue sky. I'm wearing a champion sweatshirt black long sleeve. And underneath, I'm wearing the precious red 12XL uh, t shirt that my buddy Keith bought me with the giant Polish flag printed on it in puff ink or whatever puff you know those um generally carnival type t-shirts that have kind of like puffy printing not just screen printing and uh boo boo be doop um so i don't even know what to talk about today because of the concurrent madness in both ukraine and in uh israel slash Pal- palestine so i mean i am not pro-palestinian I'm always surprised every day that Israel hasn't driven Gaza into the sea. I used to think that was a direct result of a fear of uh, what the um, blowback would be in the court of uh, Western and global opinion. I thought that may be uh, running an entire population of over two and a half million people who do have claim to that land before 1948. Um would be just considered the most appalling thing vis-a-vis the United Nations and the court of public opinion and all that other kind of stuff. And so since I think everything is a, uh, is a, is some sort of operation. And since I believe everything is some sort of inside job, that does not mean that there aren't innocent civilians in both Ukraine and Gaza Palestine, shortly the West Bank, shortly, I'm sure, sadly, Jordan, maybe even Egypt, sadly, many, many innocent civilians. Now, if this were a holy war, not an operation, then one would say in a holy war, there's no such thing as civilians, right? So, um, and this will come to pass. There's not going to be any concepts of civilians because people like uh, like Lindsey Graham says things like, this is a holy war, right? So in a holy war, you cut off the heads of heretics. Um, but I'm really surprised that uh, there's not even any foreplay at all before highly dodgy, completely unbelievable things like 40 babies with their heads cut off enter into, uh, into the world. And people are already saying that they're devils, that they're demons, that they're that they're monsters, that they're uh, animals, and so forth. And this is, of course, the fastest dehumanization campaign I've ever seen. You know, usually it takes a little while for Hill and Knowlton to ramp up and start taking pot shots by saying that uh, (coughs) Saddam's guard is dumping NICU kids onto the floors, letting them die, and that uh, every single soldier... Instead of a pack of smokes and their MREs, there's a bottle. Good morning. There's a bottle of Viagra. Um, these things are obviously rage-inducing and uh, are universally used because they're ex- extremely effective. Everybody, even Megyn Kelly, who I think has uh, a good head on her shoulders, is um, apoplectic, is rage-filled, is fire looking at her eyes. Her hair is in a giant uh, fire torch of hatred and resentment. Um, and of course, now we have, uh, we have uh, protests by uh, Palestine liberation groups all around the country and people at Harvard, supposedly, who are supporting the right of Palestine and the death of Israel are now receiving letters from Wall Street and New York City and D.C. and so forth, saying that the offers that they received of uh, jobs after they graduate and pass the bar or 
after they graduate Harvard, Yale, so forth, those offers are rescinded. So it doesn't matter whether or not this was a giant operation in order to make it possible to A, raise Gaza. There's a lot of uh, seaside property there that uh, people from Israel would love to take advantage of. And uh, But the secondary part is the quest that America has to have dominion over Iran. So uh, so we'll see if, uh, if Iran and the Persian people will be willing to either take the bait or whether they will consider this attack to be an existential crisis because, honestly, we didn't do very well leaving uh, a nice, pretty cadaver when we left Iraq and we left Afghanistan and we've still got our snoot aggressively and actively in Syria. So the promise of playing nice, considering that the West, especially the United States, and especially Israel, which is technically part of the West, uh, have been aching to destroy Iran for decades now. You know, I know that um, Iran uh, and even uh, Lebanon, these places, and, and including... Like, I'll be honest with you, including places, cities, Kabul and so forth in, um, in, uh, in Afghanistan. These were, you know, uh, moving towards Western, at least Western aesthetic and, and, uh, and feminism and modernism and, and humanism and uh, all those other isms uh, in the 60s and 70s. And then as a direct ricochet, not a ricochet, a blowback. And unintended consequences of uh, of going too far too fast and completely disrespecting their own norms, values, and cultures. Um, they made a monster. We made a monster. Who knows? The monster might have already been made. Can never really tell. So, here comes a truck. <laughs> I mean, I really don't know what to expect. I spoke to my friend Andrew yesterday <coughs> and tried to play on his, uh, what I thought. I thought he was, I mean, he gives off the signifiers of being a uh, peacenik, uh, but uh, even he kind of growled at me, which I'm not used to, about the fact that I believe that, uh, that there was a hundred percent, a thousand percent ability, probability, it was a thousand percent probability that uh, Ukraine could have kept Crimea, 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 and could never have had a war if uh, Ukraine understood that it would be, you know, kind of torn between two worlds. And if it would just talk to its neighbor a little bit over the last 30 years without listening to the other neighbors, they would understand that they could probably get all the benefits of Western integration probably most of the benefits of EU integration, probably most of the benefits of even NATO in integration without threatening Russia so much that uh, she decided that it was a, uh, it was too far. Um, we don't remember, we always forget that America has never had, really, every existential, every existential crisis that America's had has been manufactured. I mean, January 6th, for example, 9-11, for example, every single one. Um, it's been a little small localized thing uh, that has been blown out of proportion, including Trump, especially Trump. And, uh, and at no time, at no place, at no time has anybody really been existentially threatened uh, in a way that would end the United States. Uh, not only are we nicely couched between Mexico and Canada, but we're also separated from uh, other land masses, not including Alaska, because Alaska and Russia kiss. But, um, but uh, the lower 48 states uh, are decidedly thousands of miles away from harm. And while there might be an idea that uh, there's a, you know, that hyper hypersonic missiles, 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 might kind of draw that distance in, or other things like satellite weapons, or, but, you know, 
I, I'm old enough to remember the troubles in in uh, England, and I'm re- old enough to remember, uh, you know, when uh, you know in England when the IRA was really uh, kind of drumming their way. There were discotheques, there were cafes, there were buildings, there were people blown up in bombings. There were car bombs, there were IEDs, um, there were all kinds of things. There were there were melee fighting. There was uh, small unit tactics. There were people in balaclavas uh, on a daily basis. You didn't know if that day was going to be your last. My parents had friends, Nair and Eddie, who they knew in the 60s and 70s who lived in Israel. And their daily life, which they adapted to, uh, was often confronted with uh, with public bus bombings and with um, uh, open air garden market, like farmers market, kibbutz kibbutz market bombings and and uh, car bombings and and rocket attacks and missile attacks and and uh, assaults and wars. It's a very small country. I'm told that Israel is the size of Long Island. Israel is the size of Long Island, New York, so take that into account. And uh, and Russia, Russia has a explosive collar around its neck. Every single edge of Russia is surrounded by a uh, an American base that probably has nuclear weapons in it. If not, it has uh, the ability to cinch that uh, explosive collar or blow it up. Uh, Russia is completely surrounded. And so, as a result, the war with Ukraine, which is a proxy war with NATO, the West, and especially the United States and Israel, these things are existential threats. Uh, Putin is fighting for what he knows Russia to be. And he hears everybody openly talk about regime change and uh, killing, taking out Putin, and... uh, um, bombing them to smithereens, and so forth. And if you have that proximity, and if you have the will, and you have the budget, you have the unlimited uh, forever printing dollar, you are going to get into a position where you can feel like you are cornered up against the wall. Um, ergo, uh, existential crisis, right? Obviously, uh, obviously, Israel always has that existential crisis, right? Like the popular saying, it couldn't get into Yan. <laughs> I don't know what the popular saying is. Something to the effect of, if uh, if if uh, if uh, Israel gave up its weapons, put down its arms, uh, it would be erased from the map. Um, and if Palestine gave up their arms, uh, they would be reintegrated in the in all the other Islamic countries surrounding them. Um, after talking to some other people, I believe that there's more reason to Gaza and the existence of Gaza and the West Bank and all those other places. I believe that there might be more to their existence than merely uh, Israel not having the courage to raise them and then be accused of war crimes and uh, awful things like uh, ethnic cleansing. And uh, obviously, I believe that they also didn't want to get pegged. They also didn't want to get pegged with being the makers of a Holocaust because being the victims of a Holocaust is an essential tenet of their uh, of their identity, of their ethos, of their morals, of their decisions, and of their right to life. So all I can say is um, I'm going to start stop harping on the fact that um, I feel like every time anybody talks to me about Ukraine, I need to say, I told you so. You know, even before I lived in Berlin in 2008, I knew that um, it didn't make any sense, you know? I mean, if Russia were, was, is such a terrible adversary, they wouldn't openly and generously provide gas and oil and grain and all that other stuff at market rate to uh, all of Western Europe, right? So, and then they kept on doing it and doing it and doing it, and even today... If they, they never cut, they never cut the supply, they never tried to starve out uh, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Central Europe, they always had the ability to commit sanctions, commit trade restrictions, and all those other things to the people who were kind of rolling right up against uh, 
their grill. So either um, Russia continues to be a paper tiger or um, Russia is completely bought and sold by Western interest and their job is to be one of five evil empires that we have to constantly go back to. Um, now we can kind of pivot back to the Middle East as evil empire, evil Iran, who apparently has a lifetime supply of uh, American flags that they can burn and stomp on because that's their favorite thing. That's how they get their cardio in the morning. In the morning, good morning, in the morning, there's a people wake up, unwrap a new flag, burn it, stomp upon it, and say, death to America. That is, in, in China, in Japan, you know, they have those TV shows or they have those morning wake up kind of um, body weight aerobic exercise routines that, you know, keep them all limber and in shape. But in Iran, they do that same level of activity, but as a uh, dramatic reenactment of death to America, burning the American flag. So if you hear about dead babies, like I say in all my episodes, the moment you hear about dead babies... Uh, Viagra in rations, um, uh, dead widows, girls, women, targeted hospitals, hospices, NICUs. Uh, the moment you hear that and you never hear um, hit a hit a missile silo or or any if you never hear that they've ever, ever hit in any firing that they ever hit a legitimate target, then you're probably not talking to reported news you're probably talking to Hill and Knowlton talking points. Anyway, that's the end of my episode. I love you guys. Uh, apparently, I did talk about all the things I wasn't supposed to. So, uh, sorry, and you're welcome. And I love you, and I'll talk to you later. This was The Chris Abraham Show, Season 6, Episode 3. Ciao. Thank you for listening to The Chris Abraham Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Until next time.